Hello everybody and uh, welcome to Organian's Puzzle Box. If you're here, that means that you want to start making cinematics in Unreal Engine and you don't really know where to start. So I have you covered because in this tutorial we'll be going through all the basic uh, things that you'd need to know to be able to start making cinematics in Unreal Engine and really have a bit of a, a you know, a clear understanding of what does what and how to achieve that. So stay tuned because we're going to go in depth for people who don't know how to make any cinematics in Unreal Engine and we're starting right now. So in this tutorial, you'll, ex you'll specifically learn how to set up your project, how, what the UI functionality of Sequencer, you know, what, what's all the functionality, what do you need to know about the Sequencer itself, how to do post-process and color grade, uh, how to do some camera work, some advanced tips and tricks on how to use uh, the movie render queue, and also how to export your Unreal Engine footage. Now, please bear in mind that we're, I'm going to link in the description below how to import your meshes into Unreal Engine from another D DCC as well, which is going to be quite useful to you or how you can export meshes out of unreal and put them into blender or something like that to be able to use it in there and then bring them back into unreal engine and that's quite useful so have a look at that video in the description below but yeah let's uh, let's begin and also if you'd like to make something like the stuff that you see behind me please have a look at my assets um on, on for our you know organians puzzle box and our station gumroad patreon or anything like that and you can find the stuff that i've got behind me now we want to delve straight into project setup and I have opened Unreal Engine as you can see and this is basically what we're getting whenever you open Unreal Engine and you don't have a project that you're opening it's just opening Unreal Engine itself. Um, and then from here because we want to create cinematics we've got a couple of options to choose from we've got some projects that we can open that we've already made so these are going to be your personal projects but we also have some categories and there's a games category there's a film video and live events category there you got things like architecture automotive and simulations but for us it, we want to go to film and video live and events now the, um, these setups that we've got in here are generally for virtual production, pretty much most of them. But the one that we've got in here, the blank one, is normally how I like to start my projects if I'm going to do a cinematic of any kind. Um, and then you have some options to either in enable ray tracing, or you could do this at a later time if you'd like, or if you'd like to have the starter content included. For this particular case, we don't actually need it, but feel free to do so if you'd like to have some extra content, such as shapes and things like that added to your project. Again, you can add this later on if you'd like. So when you create the project, you've got to set up a location wherever you want the project to be done. I'll just, uh, I can put this into my downloads, and I'm going to call this a cinematic tutorial right so once you do that you can name it to whatever you want once you press the create button this will start launching unreal engine and as you can see unreal engine is now loading up and you will be greeted with the usual um unreal engine uh you know window uh, so that's the default window and there's nothing really special about anything that i've done here but normally that's how you'd want to start setting up for a project so once you do that you have your um you know, your initial setup, you're going to sometimes get some errors like lightning needs to be rebuilt or things like that. I would ignore that for now, but if you really want to do it, you can just build the lightning and the levels in here. This isn't always the case that you're going to get this problem. Um, so with the scene involved, we've got a couple of elements in here. Uh, this particular one comes with a setup of an atmospheric fog, a floor, which is not a landscape, it's just simply a mesh. And then we have some um, a light source, player star, so if you press play in the level, that's where we're going to start at. And then the sky sphere, skylight, and the uh, reflection caption. So this is a very basic Unreal Engine setup. We have no camera or anything whatsoever in this. It's now time for us to start doing that, effectively setting everything up uh, for the project. In order for us to start editing our cinematic, um, let's just assume we actually have a scene in here, um, some things are happening, uh, obviously for the time being we have nothing, but let's say we want to start our cinematic straight away, so what do we do? Now effectively, you can do this in a couple of ways, but I'll show you the two main ways. Well, the first one is you press the control space button in order to reveal the content browser, and this is it, um, and you could right click, go to cinematics and add a level sequence, 
or uh, and by the way i would ignore the other two for now that's definitely a bit more advanced so what we're talking about right now we're just going to focus on the level sequence um so you could uh, use a level sequence from here or you can go up here and press this arrow and you've got two options you can add a level sequence just like we did before or you can add a master sequence which is effectively a collection of all of your level sequences that you can play in various different sort of scenarios like you can combine multiple level sequences together so you get different sort of uh, setups in your scene or different flows of uh, different scenes for different cameras and so on but we're going to add a level sequence and then we get this page where it's asking us where do we want to save it. So I'm going to leave it as new level sequence and I'm going to add it right here in the main folder. I'm going to press save. And this has already added the level sequence into our world. And this is going to be the panel for the level sequence. Now to make things easier, I'm just going to drag this down here into the scene like that and just put it like that, right? So this is a, a way for you to dock the sequence that you can dock it in here where you can just use it standalone as a frame like that if you'd like. Um, and now uh, you can you'll notice that it's actually an actor in the world and it's dropped right about here you can reposition this wherever you want it doesn't really matter and you will see that it's got the level sequence asset loaded up which is this one here and you've got a few options like autoplay loop the sequence play rate and things like that but that's those are not necessarily options that you need to modify from here you can modify them in the sequence itself which is going to be this panel over here so now let's just go through the main ui functions of the sequencer just so you familiarize yourself with the setup and, and what everything does so you're able to actually use those tools yourself okay now let's go over the ui settings in the sequencer so i'm gonna make this into sort of two lists one of them is the uh, list that you're actually going to be using and it's going to be important to you and it's also quite simple to understand and then there's the complex list of things that you really shouldn't be touching at least not right now there's no point you need to learn a lot more about this before proceeding so uh the first thing on over here is this uh, sort of panel which says it's the main editor of the level sequence nothing you need to do in here i would just leave it as it is and just move on uh, you don't need to, to play with that the second one is if you've made any sort of um, changes to the sequence then you can save uh, the current sequence and any subsequent subse subsequences on this the next button is to find in the content browser whatever you've got selected so let's say you select something in the world and you press this button this will open the content browser although in this particular case it will always just show you the sequence because that's the only thing that's selected when there's nothing in the sequence uh, so that's what that button does but if you have in here for example um, i don't know this uh, plane this floor for example if that would be in here then you'd be able to search for where that floor is coming from just by pressing that button the next button is to create a new camera and set it at the current as the current camera cut this is a good example of just setting up cameras very quickly through the sequence itself because it's already added into here as well rather than going through the usual method which would be over in here right clicking and then going into um you know in th this panel and then finding yourself a camera which you can then add into here so you've got multiple options that uh, you know there's multiple different cameras that you could add uh, so if you go to for example, um, over here and start typing camera, sorry, not there, uh, over here at the top. So you, you got a camera animation sequence, that's the only thing that it can find, because effectively you want to add cameras from here. So in the, in the content browser, you can't really add the camera, you can just have a look at cinematics and so on. But if you press this plus button in here, you will have options to add various different cameras, which can be useful to you. But the default option in sequence, it will add a cinema, a cine camera actor uh, to be used. So that's a very nice and very useful sort of uh, tool that we have in there. The next bit is to actually render the cinematic that you've done. And it also has two modes, which is the movie render queue. And it also have the movie scene capture, which is a legacy option. We're actually going to go through that later on in the video as well. Um, the next one is the blueprint, which this is part of the advanced options. You don't actually want to do anything to this unless you know what you're doing. So I wouldn't use that option. Uh, the next one just gives you a various different sort of options that are pretty much self-explanatory if you start reading them and what they do but you're able to do things like importing a sequence exporting sequences and so on um again not a lot of use for this to be honest people don't usually use any of this when they do cinematic this is part more of the advanced sort of tab of things 
Um, the next one is the visibility. So what you can see here on the bar, and actually when we start adding some elements to this, you'll be able to notice some of the changes that we can do, like for example, layer bars or, um, you know, uh, for example, like this channel colors for X, Y, and Z, and you'll see how that functions. The next option here is for you to set up a start point of the timeline and an end point. And you've got various different things such as the playback speed of the of the animation or if you want the playback range to be locked and other th things like that this is a combination of basic um uh, options and advanced options i would say the start and end uh, of your animation sequence is uh, the only option that you really need at the start to do anything uh, and you can also set that up through the tab through the bar in here as well and i'll show you just in just a couple of minutes how we do that the next uh, option is how are the keys being generated, what type of keys they are. By default, you're setting up cubic, and then also any changes that you make to the meshes that are in the sequence will then register as a key. Uh, but this only functions if you have this option in here, or if you actually press the, uh, you know, to make a sequence, in which you'll see when we add an object in here. Um, this button over here, if you keep it pressed, any change that you make to an object that's already got a key in place will then automatically register another change and uh, add a new, key, a new key in the timeline automatically, which is quite useful. Um, and then the next option in here is what type of edits we're allowing, either edits for... Uh, you know, actors or parts that are already in the sequence, or, um, you know, allow, are we allowing any sort of level edits to be done, which a level edit would be something like, you click the slide source, let's say it's in your sequence, and you change some options right here in the detail panel, so this will allow you to either do those edits or not, depending on what you've done. The next option is if you have any snapping, so if you press over here, we'll show you what type of snaps are available, and whether or not these are active. Generally, I keep this as deactivated, it's more of an advanced option, and you don't really need it if you're going to make a, you know, a basic animation. It's really based on the complexity of what you're trying to build. The next bit is setting up the uh, FPS, so how many frames per second does your animation have? Normally, you'd want to go for 24 FPS if you're making a film. 60 FPS is generally for things like, you know, if you want them to feel a lot more like a video game. But ultimately, it doesn't matter how slow the scene that you have is functioning at. So let's say your scene and your project functions at 30 FPS because that's how much of a performance impact things in your scene have. When you export the render, it will be exported at 60 FPS or whatever you've set it up as. So it doesn't really matter if your computer is slow, the uh, outcome, the render, will have the FPS that you've set in here and in the export options later on. Now, the next option is the animation curve, the sequencer curves. And this is where you can sort of refine um, an animation. Let's say you have things like a, a lift going up and down, and maybe you want to set the curve so that it slows down when it almost reaches the the, the you know the end so the lift's going up so right at the end it slows down and then when it comes down again you might want to be able to do that as well so this is quite a useful tool uh, but it's definitely for more advanced uses and i wouldn't necessarily try this now by default just so you know the sequencer does function with um, sort of uh, like a like curves in mind and what i mean by this is like if you have a cubic um keynote the keyframe that you're adding um, imagine that it will always uh, so so between frame zero and 100 and 100 for example frame 50 will be the peak of whatever that frame of whatever that animation is doing so let's say the animation is moving from point a to point b then at frame 50 that's when the speed of that animation is the fastest so it goes from a so, you know starts slow and then goes up to 50 frames which has the highest speed of its of its direction of wherever this uh uh, you know, mesh, meshes may be moving to. And then once it reaches point B, it slows down again. So it comes to a halt. But if you're using a linear method, then the mesh, for example, will accelerate from A to B at a constant speed. Okay. Uh, so that's kind of the kind of the difference there, right? But with curves, you're able to further refine this. Now, um, let's just uh, have a look in terms of, uh, you know, doing some setups in here, adding some basic sort of... Uh, uh, you know, like a basic mesh on and get it to animate and let's just see what happens if we do that. I'm just going to deactivate myself from the view in here so that we can have a better view of our viewport, uh, right? Um, okay, and now what we want to do is we want to start making a basic animation. So, uh, how do we start? First thing you want to do is you want to add a camera. 
But before you add the camera, do you really want the animation to be from 0 to 150 in this particular case? And do you want it to be at 60 FPS? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the animation to 24 FPS, which you can see the timeline has now changed to reflect that. And we can control back, you know, scroll backwards to see the, the sort of the timeline a lot better. And then we can either click this button to set a start and end point. So let's say the start is at 0, but the end point could be at... 300 or 500 or whatever so let's just do um maybe i don't know 240 um frames okay so now we have you can see the timeline is extended and if we want to manually extend this we can select the timeline and drag it and you will notice that now the timeline can become bigger or smaller if we press ctrl z to undo that will take it back to 240. so our timeline is between 0 to 240. Now, the next thing we want to do is we want to add the camera. So I'm just going to press this button over here, which will automatically add the camera. Let me just pull this um, a bit higher up like that. So we can see what sort of options we now have for the camera. You can also, uh, you'll also notice that a camera cut track has been added automatically over here, which is quite essential because this allows us to add other, another camera or it allows us to, control, to see the sequence as it's being played back throughout through all the cameras so what we can do over here is we can just go maybe to like this frame 110 or 111 and press this button over here where it will allow us to sort of set a new camera but as you can as you notice there actually isn't another camera to select and that's because we only have one camera in the world which is over here added by the sequencer which by the way also means that if you close the sequence the camera will disappear from the world and it will reopen when you open the sequence again so now i can press this uh, button over here to add a new camera and as you can see we now have a second camera in here uh, but on the track, it's only Cine camera acted on, which is the first camera that we added. The second one is not there. So for us to uh, be able to add the second one, we can now press this button and select Cine camera actor 2, which will automatically add it where wherever our um, timeline was at. So currently at 111. So I'm pressing that and you can see Cine camera 2 has been added. Now, both of these cameras are showing us the same thing. So let's just change the angle. The first thing we want to do we can either right click the camera over here and select pilot. You also notice that a window in here has been has showed up to, to showcase to us what the cameras are viewing. Or you can uh, go over here and you can press this button, which will automatically make you pilot the camera. And now with control, you know, with right click and WSD, you can move the camera around. So this camera is going to be looking like that at the floor. And then I'm going to press this button over here for the second camera. And now this camera is going to be looking from this side at the floor. OK, uh, now let's just scroll up here and you'll notice when I do this, nothing really changes. Right. And that's because we're only viewing the second camera right now because that's our active one. So we can press this button over here, which now has switched our view to any camera that's active. So then if I go over here, that's camera one and that's camera two. And if I press space bar, this will play and then the automatically we will switch to camera two like that so this is quite useful uh, now one thing that i want to point out is that the uh, the sequence itself starts at zero and finishes at 240 so i have a recommendation for you in order to get no real artifacts at the start of a scene over here at frame zero just control scroll forward to go closer and you can select this sort of cut in here and you'll notice you're able to extend it. So I would extend this past frame 0 to maybe like minus 0, 0, 004. Your frame render starts at 0, but you're adding a bit of extra sort of information here at the front, which is very important. And then over here at the back, you may want to add again another sort of you know going above that like that as well so this is this ensures you're not really going to get any artifacting at the start and the end of the scene okay so now we have this setup which is quite neat um let's just get some basic movement done in here so we'll do camera one let's go to maybe like frame zero zero two and then we have some options in here for camera zero zero one okay i'm going to press it so to basically pilot it which I can also eject out of that if I want by pressing this button so now I'm not piloting any camera but it will show me which camera is activated so if I press any of these you will see it switches so let's just uh, pilot this camera again 
And over here, we have some options like the focal length, the aperture and things like that. And those are more related to the camera options itself, the camera lens, which you can also change on this size here. And generally in the details panel, if you have this sort of button over here to, uh, you know, that indicates that you can add a keyframe. If you press that button, it will automatically create a keyframe point in the sequence, whatever your timeline is. But first, we're going to use the transform. Now, if we open, expand the transform, we're going to have location, rotation, and scale. Scale doesn't really do much for the camera apart from scaling up the mesh. So this camera does actually have a mesh that is loaded, and you can see it over here. If we double click it, this is the camera mesh that we will be able to see in the world. And what I mean by this is if we eject, then it'll go backwards. We should, in theory, yeah, there we go. That's one of the cameras right there. And wherever the other one is i'm not really sure but yeah it's it's somewhere in here anyway so that's one of the cameras right there that's the second camera and then we have the first camera somewhere uh <laughs> right okay but let's just go back and make sure that we pilot the first camera that we want uh which it seems that i've actually moved a bit so let me just put it that way so it looks again where we want it to look uh, so I wouldn't necessarily play with the scale, but on the other hand, we can play with the location and rotation. So we can either press this button to add a keyframe for everything, or we can press this the, these buttons over here like that, and then we've added a keyframe for the location and the rotation. Now, what we can also do is we can go over to frame maybe, you know, 102 or something like that. And now if I move forward, a new keyframe has not been added, but if I do anything to the timeline, then the camera position resets. So for us to save that information, we can press this key point in here or move the camera further and then add this, these sort of points in here. But you've noticed that the moment I've added them, uh, it's sort of reverted back. And that's a bit of a, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit sad because that's not something that would happen in a software like Blender or anything like that, but other, or other software like that. So in a real engine, that's what happens. So that's why I am effectively, um, you know, pretty much giving you the recommendation to press this key before doing any animation, then move the sequence. And once you stop the animation, you'll notice the new keyframes have been added. And now if I go back, you'll notice the animation plays and you can see it around this point is where the speed is at its most and it slows down. So now we have an animation for our first camera. So if I go into this particular point again, we've got an animation and then we're switching to the second camera and nothing is really happening. OK, um, now what we can do uh, in here, we could also play around with the rotation, which we don't really have any any sort of animation in there. But as you can see, we're in between points. So what if we want to be exactly at this point? I'm just going to open the rotation and you'll be able to see that the only thing that has changed supposedly in the rotation is just the pitch. So if I go all the way here, you can see that the pitch has slightly indeed moved, but we could do, we could probably do more. So maybe look a bit further down and then we can also play around with the roll. So we could roll the camera like that. And then we can go back to the first timeline and then press play and you'll notice how the animation changes. And that's pretty cool, right? Um, that's that's pretty much how we just animated the camera in there, which was, you know, very basic stuff, nothing complicated. Now, in terms of the camera options in here, you've, uh, you have various different things, such as what type of film back we're using. So we've got uh, some presets already, which these presets will change the settings underneath to make them function the way we would like. Normally, I recommend that you use a 16 by 9 DSLR and then you can have a look at the lens settings if you want um, a sort of a different kind of focal point. And, you know, we could probably do like a 12 millimeters, for example, for very wide angle sort of shots. We could do like uh, 85, you know, 100 or 85, which will again be quite good for things like portraits and things like that. But it's really this is this is more about you doing your research and what best looks for the footage that you're trying to do. Uh, some of the settings in here for uh, f-stops and squeeze factor and so on, these are all settings portrayed by things like, um, you know, cameras in 
general in real life so they will the camera in unreal engine will behave like the one in, in real life uh so these settings pretty much make sense in that regard now one thing and also we've gotten here is like the focus and the focus method is by default set to manual to this distance but if you start to take this down you'll notice how our camera you know how the view has now been completely blurred you can also have a look at doing a disable so then you have no mode no uh focus uh, sorry, the focus is pretty much 100% across the whole camera spectrum, uh, camera view. But you could also set this to tracking, and then with tracking selected, you can so you can select this button over here and just eye drop this eye dropper, uh, and just select your floor, and now it will focus on the floor. So the the floor is the only thing that we've really got in the scene, so the focus will be on that. But if we had another object in here in front. So let's just say, you know, we go in here to add a basic shape. So we're adding a sphere. Um, and I'm going to bring the sphere a lot sort of closer to the camera. Maybe something like that. I don't know. We just see. Yeah, something like that. So basically, it should, you know, right about here, it sort of gets it a bit more out of focus but you are going to have to play around with this until you get some you know some proper settings on it so with the camera selected again you can have a look in here in, the, in terms of the uh you do a debug plane to see where the camera is looking and you need various different effects in here in order to get um sort of you know the effect that you want for that um but if we switch this back to manual and we again could do something like this you know right now it's focusing very clearly on the sphere uh but not so much on the background so we could do something like that so it's very much focusing on the sphere but the background is still in blur um and you know this, these are just settings to tweak around for that um but that's you know that's really how you add a very basic animation for a camera movement uh rolling and and you know, transforming and then you can do the same thing to the second camera which will pretty much carry on through the animation um you know indefinitely and um if you want to add into the sequencer some other object so let's say you know we'll just put this here to one side let's say we're going to add this floor so you can actually select it in here and just drag and drop it like that and it will automatically add it and you can now track certain things but you could also press this track button over here and you can select actors from sequence and you can select the floor there's some other options in here as well so there's uh, various different things but again those are definitely more advanced options you know you can add a time dilation track so whatever that track is you can actually slow things down so you can have a slow motion effect or you can have a, a, an effect where things are speeding up so that the time dilation track is really useful for playback to be quite slow or quite fast and actually if i you know if i actually select that so i've just got a time dilation track and we say well actually i want this to move at 0.2 uh, you can see in here that um, this is where the time dilation is um, and now sorry and now if i go and i start playing it you'll notice that the entire animation is now moving at 0.2 but if i select this at one it will move at one again so that's what that time dilation does you can only you can't really limit it you can add some um you, you can do some some settings for it but you can't really and so this time dilation is just applied everywhere really um and then you have in here um you can press this track button again and you've got in fears you know in, in things like like i said to you add the floor sorry you can add the floor and you can see it's over here and now if we want to start um changing the floor transform let me just bring it up here again so we can properly see it well, the transform has already been added but we can press this track button and we have other things that you can add so for example if you want it if it, you want an audio to play with it or you want to attach it to something to another sort of um, part inside the sequencer or maybe you want to hide it so if i select that you'll see that the visibility is set to on, the key is pressed, so I could say, right, here it's visible, but when I get to here, it's no longer visible. So now if I press the track, it's visible, and then it disappears, right? So that's an interesting way of uh, dealing with things and, you know, just uh, making a mesh disappear like that, right? That's pretty, pretty basic, but it's really good. Now, you will notice that a track has been created, and what's really cool about this track is that you can actually extend it 
uh, decrease it and it, the track will represent where these frames are you can also select them both you know can select, select that and move the animation somewhere further down the line so maybe you want this to disappear here so we just that was quite easy but you can move multiple tracks because this tracks everywhere or anything that we've created you can also select this eyedrop uh, in here and select channel colors and this will tell you that that is the x channel y channel and this in here is the z channel so if i go and just press this you can see x y and z so just bear that in mind that's pretty cool to see as well um the visibility track only has one linear sort of uh, option it doesn't sorry not a linear it's more of a yes or no kind of thing so there isn't any any x and y and z for that because there's no vector information into it um but uh, yeah that's quite useful to be done as well and this this uh, layer bar has been introduced from 5.1 above so it's not present in, present in 5 in unreal engine 5 or unreal, uh, unreal engine 4.27 either now we've got a very basic setup in here for a camera movement nothing really fancy like i've said but let's just say you know you want to spice up the scene a little bit and just have something else to, in there to look at you know make it more interesting um and i'm going to show you a more advanced sort of um uh, part of that in just a little bit in a different project but for this particular project let me just go through the basics of some of the things that you can do with something which is called the post-process volume which that effectively is the best tool for cinematics and what you're going to do is you're going to press this cube over here and if you go to um, cinematic sorry not to visit to visual effects you're going to have an option called post process volume and you can drag that into the scene and it automatically has placed it somewhere well I'm sorry not automatically but it's placed it somewhere in the scene and then we have an option where we can reset the location of it to zero 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 now, let me just get out of the camera view and let me just get close to this post process. It's right here in the center of the world. Now, by default, the post process is a sort of a cube, a container, if you'd like. Now, this could be increased. So if we look at the scale, we can actually press this lock button in here so we can then scale it up on every part. And as you can, you'll notice, let me just press G on the keyboard so we can actually see all the outlines. Um, you can, you know, let if I scale this up or down, this, this makes this, uh, container, you know, be bigger or smaller. So what this means is that if your camera is within these bounds, you will see the effect of the post process. And if it's outside, you won't be able to see it at all. So let's just uh, look at the first option in here, not the mobile depth of field, but the bloom. And I'm going to change, I'm going to select the method and I'm going to leave it as standard, but I'm going to put the intensity to maybe like a five or actually... Uh, I don't know, maybe a 50 or something. You'll notice nothing's happened. Or let's just put it at 10. It's, I think 50 will be too much. Nothing's happening because we are outside the post process. So now if I drive into it, you can see that the bloom has been applied. And if we play around with this setting, you'll see the bloom taking effect. We go out, the bloom is gone. Now, one way to make this post process be global, uh, there is an option way further down here where it says infinite extent. So if you tick that button, the post process, regardless how big it is, will be applied to the whole world, okay? And there is a priority slider, which means that some uh, post processes, let's say you have one, uh, I'll show you what I mean. Let's say we just duplicate this and we have it over here. But the second one, so I've duplicated it by alt, left clicking and dragging on the um, direction a bit. So let's say this one is not an, infinite, not an infinite extent. This is actually just a normal cube. So when we drive inside of it, it should change things so i'm going to go to the bloom and put this to 100. now if i sort of go inside you'll notice the bloom has changed to 100 and the reason for that is because by default unreal engine recognizes that the post process that it's got uh an it's not got an infinite uh extent will take priority over the infinite extent when you enter that uh post process but let's just say both of them are sort of uh you know like that overlapping and then neither of them have got an infinite extent okay so we'll do that so now when you go inside this is 10 and as you can see it sort of takes precedence and i'm not really sure how unreal engine decides this which one is the most important one to be showcased but i think it's mainly to do which one was first and which one was second but if you want the second one to be to take an effect then you've got you set this priority to one which then means that if you drive in here, we've got the first one. Go in here, it's now the second one. So no matter what you do, 
the, the higher the priority, the more that, you know, post process will overrule the other one. Now let's um, delete the second one and keep the first one. We'll activate infinite extent. And let's just go back to our bloom. Set this maybe to like a four or something like that. Uh, you can also get a better bloom effect by say, switching from standard to convolution, but then convolution will require a higher number to get the same sort of effect of the bloom that you got with standard, uh, but it's generally higher quality. So uh, I would definitely advise that you use the convolution one if, if you're doing cinematics. Now, with that in mind, some other things that you can do, you can play around with the exposure. So in here, you can set up some options. Now, some of them are quite advanced. So we're just going to focus on the more simplistic ones. So that would be a min and max EV, uh, you know, EV from just like an environmental light. So if we sort of put this to like a zero, you'll get more light in. You can also put this to a minus 10 to get a lot more light in. But what effectively this does, it clamps the light between these values. So you could improve, you can increase this number uh, for the minimum or you can decrease it like that. But as long as the max EV has got a different sort of option, then you already see much from the minimum. So minimum generally you want to leave it as default minus 10, but it's the max one that will change things. So this will allow your scene not to become over bright or overexposed or underexposed if you set it to, for, to a manual sort of option. But if we deactivate it now, uh, this is if you go into a dark room and then come outside, it will be overexposed and then it will sort of tone down. But with this setting, it will sort of stay put where it is. Um, some other things that you can do in here, you can add a, a chromatic aberration, which I'm pretty sure people know that the chromatic aberration is like a distortion from the camera lens. If you'd like that, I generally don't really like it, but feel free to use it. You can also use a dirt mask. Normally, if you click on here to add a texture, you can add your own texture. But you can also search in Unreal Engine for dirt, which will then add a dirt mask. And the dirt mask, if we increase our intensity to maybe like uh, 500, you'll notice it. But this lens flare is kind of getting in the way. And this is one of the ugliest lens flare, actually, that there is out there. I would definitely recommend you do your own custom one. But you can get that from the local, ex sorry, not the local exposure, for the lens flare. You can set the intensity to zero and then the lens flare is gone. And you can see the dirt mask in there being generated from that texture that we've added. If we put that to zero, there's no more dirt. But if we add it, we'll see it again in there. Um, also, we can do a vignette effect. So with the image effects, you can take this on and then you can add an, an, a vignette. Now... Bear in mind, there are many options in Unreal Engine where they're not actually limited to one or zero or whatever, like this vignette slider would imply that it's either zero or one. You can actually put this to three if you'd like, or two. So this gives you a lot more authoring over your scene if you do that. Um, it's not just what the what Unreal Engine is allowing you to put as a number. And then you have things like depth of field, which will obviously add depth of field and this will need um, like more advanced knowledge of the scene setup and what you're trying to achieve. Um, and I, I do believe that I've gone over the camera settings in here, like for example, shutter ISO and things like that. Generally, nobody really plays around with this unless they have a very specific purpose. So again, more advanced. And um, just so you know, the post process um, also allows you to do color grading, but it also allows you to set certain parameters such as force global illumination to be lumen um, or uh, what reflections to have. And generally, I would advise sort of like um, using lumen with um, you can have a look at things like lightning quality, put that to, higher, to a higher number. Uh, lumen scene detail, if you increase this, your performance will start tanking. So I wouldn't recommend using that uh, above one um, you can also use the advanced tab in here which generally cranking these numbers up will give you better better uh, performance like for example you can get a higher trace of lumen so it goes further out into the distance rather than just be quite close to you um, so you're able to see that uh, nice you know nicer effect also for the reflections i would use room and reflections sets a quality of two and then high quality reflections as well if you've got material set up in your scene to use that uh, and these are more sort of intermediary to advanced options, but I'm just showing them to you just because ticking these boxes will give you better results anyway by default if you're using Lumen. Now, some other things in here, uh, you've got like a fill, like, like the color grading. So color grading is quite self-explanatory. It's one of the basic fundamentals of when you do uh, cinematics and movies and so on. Color grading is necessary to get your 
cinematic to look as good as it can do. I would stay away from doing color grading in Unreal Engine directly if you can. I would definitely advise you using color grading in a different sort of software uh, like the Vinci Resolve or Adobe Premiere where they have more advanced options. But if you really want to, there's a slew of options in here as well in Unreal Engine for color grading. So I'm sure you can get the most out of it if you start experimenting. But there's like so many options in here and I definitely consider them for advanced users. Um, now further down in here, you are also able to do things like uh, film grain. So we can add an intensity of one to film grain. And now we got some film grain in there. Uh, there's all sorts of different um, uh, options. Sorry about that. Um, over in here where we've got like the post process material where you can add the custom post process material. And I do have a tutorial uh, on my channel about doing a sharpness filter if you'd like to see that. Um, you can also play around with ambient occlusion, but this does not work if you're using Lumen, so, you know, tough luck with that. <laughs> uh, but then you can do things like changing the motion blur amount, translucency settings, and, and so on, and things like that, right? What type of translucency you want to use, pass tracing, which again, very advanced. Um, but that's kind of the things that you can do with the post process. In here, you can also do a bit of, um, like, you know, with the camera settings, do a bit of settings on the camera, so doing some manual settings for the camera. But I would, what I would advise is you doing your, your camera changes inside the camera options in here, because you've got so many different ones. I've just gone through the most the basic ones instead of more complex ones. But let me just show you a more advanced scene of something that I've done and just how some of these things come together and what they do and what an actual timeline looks like when you're doing something more complex, uh, like using particles and using various different shapes moving on the screen. Okay, so this is a scene that I've got in Unreal Engine about uh, a planet traversing through the solar system and, you know, just a couple of asteroids and things like that. Now, this scene, by default, is very dark. Um, it's got a lot of atmosphere into it, you know, space and so on. But if I go in here and, you know, I find my post-process volume and I untick it, you'll notice it's actually, there's quite a lot of stuff going on, but the post-process is by default masking a lot of that that's because i want my focal point to be the center of the scene and i have a sequence for this and this is the uh, sequence right here now what you'll notice is that this sequence is between 0 to 900 frames uh, or you know actually a bit more than 900 actually if we press over here it's going to be 996 and we have various different elements with various different uh animated sequences including a system life cycle for a Niagara particle so if you want your Niagara particles to actually spawn in a sequence you have to use a system life cycle for that to happen or a trigger for them to happen normally I just use the life cycle which ensures that these will loop um, as long as it's a looping sort of uh, element but if you want to trigger it maybe a burst or something like that then you can trigger through by pressing the plus um track in here and you have an event where you can do a trigger or repeat it but for me the life cycle is what ensures that the this uh, this particle system constantly animates so if we actually um you know go over here and select our camera we can play the animation so let me just press uh, play i do have these options in here where i can play the animation and see the timeline and if you'd like to see this as well all you have to do is just press over here and um sorry over here in perspective and select cinematic viewport normally you have a default viewport but you want to be in a cinematic viewport so i am already as i said to you i'm already piloting the camera i'm at frame zero i'm just going to press play and this is the animation the camera moves goes like that and nothing really fancy is going on we're just sort of moving through the scene and that's that. Now, there's a thing, right? If I would render right now exactly what's going on in this scene, something more will show up, not just what we're seeing right now. Some various different things will happen in this scene that currently, in our current state, are not visible. And that's because some of my effects in this particular scene are driven by blueprints. So, what I mean by this is that if we would like to see some of those blueprints fire in this animation, we first have to press the play button and then press space. And you'll notice that there's a planet right there that's currently rotating another, another uh, around another planet and both of these are moving into space. And this is driven by blueprints, at which point this rock comes hurling towards us and hitting us, so to speak. So, 
and, and also because that animation just continues after this, I now the planet is further away from us, so we we're not we're not gonna get the same sort of animation happening unless I stop the sequence because I don't have a reset for the planet sort of direction. It just rotates around the sun, right? But the reason why some of these uh, this effect is only visible during play is because it's an effect that is only firing at runtime. But when you're rendering, you are also in play mode. So by default, the play mode is active when you're rendering a scene from the sequencer. And regardless of, uh, of how you do it, if you do it for the movie render queue or if you do it through um, the legacy player. So actually, that takes me to the next point, which is how do you actually export an animation out of an Unreal, out of Unreal Engine uh, so then you can use? And there are two ways. There's one a newer way that's been released probably about three years ago or something like that, but it's a lot more advanced than the usual way, which is very limited and not a, not a lot of options are presented to you. So let's go through both of these options so that you can understand what you need to do. Okay, now the first thing, if you want to export with the new method, which is the better method, you've got to make sure that you've got the plugin enabled. So if you go into your plugins for Unreal Engine, um, you can actually type in here movie render. So this will show up a movie render queue. And for me, it's already active. You can also do a movie render queue additional render passes, but normally you just need a movie render queue. Once you activate that, if it's not already activated in your project, then restart the, the whole the Unreal Engine. It will automatically ask you to restart, and then you'll have the plugin to play with. Once you do that, in your sequencer in here, over to this up to these three dots over here you're going to have two options movie render queue and movie scene capture which is the legacy option let's first look at the movie render queue so with that selected i can actually press this button over here which will then open a new a window which is this one right this is the setup window so we have a config that's not saved and we could save the config once we change some things about it, or we can create new ones. We can press the new render button and we can select what cameras are being uh, used. So in this particular uh, point, this cine camera no shot is the one that's being uh, rendered, right? Um, and it gives us some details as to where, what level this is in and what sequence it belongs to, which is this current sequence and this current level. Now, if I press the unsaved config button, a new option, well, new window will pop up, which gives us a default sort of settings, which is our output, the type of rendering, which is kind of always deferred rendering, and then a J JPEG sequence. That's what we're going to get out of this export. We can load and save our preset to something else. So we can load a new preset or um, add a new one. So. Right now, let's just look at the options that are available to us for exporting. If I press the setting button in here, we'll have various different things that we can do. And I'm going to go for the most important ones and the ones that you should worry about. And, you know, you shouldn't really be worrying about the other options as much now because the rest of them are for advanced. Now, for quality, you want to use anti-aliasing. So if you press that, you will see automatically it's been added over here. And what anti-aliasing is doing, it's allowing you to set up um, your scene so that it gets a lot more crisp images with, uh, you know, doing uh, the same sequence, rendering it from various different sort of angles at various degrees, so very small uh, angles of the camera moving left, back and right and so forth because it's trying to reconstruct an image that's not lacking any anti-aliasing, so it's very crisp, very sharp. Now, there is an article that I'm going to link down below that goes through the, these details in a lot more um, detail, but it's very important that you understand that anti-aliasing is one of those settings that will ma basically make your scene look a lot better. So normally, what you want to do is keep your override, you know, press the override anti-aliasing method and make sure this is set to none so that you get the best possible looking image for the cinematic. And then the temporal sample count, you know, the spatial, you keep it at one, but the temporal sample count, you'd want to do this as an eight or 16 or something like that. But imagine this means that every frame will be rendered eight times before a final render comes out. So bear that in mind before doing anything. Now, you can also uh, select some options in here, like, for example, render warm-up frames, which will help you to not have any sort of artifacting or glitching at the start of your scene, or maybe you have some Niagara particles that need to actually start playing before you see the sequence unfold. And it will, they will have some explanations over into here. Normally, if you, let's say, your particle system is at its full 
peak at the frame 300, then and that's what you want to display the first time you see it, then maybe you want to add some render warm-up frames to 300 and 300, you know, something like that. But it's really important to work out these numbers depending on the project that you're doing. The next option in here that you want to look at is this game overrides, which allows you to basically do things like disable texture streaming. So it's going to have to, to give you crisp textures rather than load uh, lower resolution textures and then sort of stream them into the higher ones. This could cause quite a lot of artifacts and glitching while you do this. Imagine if you have a LOD on a tree and then the tree looks bad, but then when you get close with with the camera, it looks better. This is going to help you mitigate that. And generally, most of the settings is already comes in as a pre-default. That's it's good to just, you know, pretty much leave it as it is. Then the next one that you'd want to do in here is uh, high resolution in case maybe you have a system that's crashing and it's not able to cope because if you increase the title count, it will basically split the scene into four. Uh, so one frame into four, maybe you're doing a 4K render and it's crashing. You can do this in four frames so that you get uh, less uh, VRAM used, but this will not work with anti-aliasing with a temporal sample count. So you'd have to put that to one again if you want to use high resolution or disable it entirely. But this is more of an optional thing, but it's very important that you use if you're getting crashes. Um, then you can also go in here um, from that and you have some options as to what type of exports you want. This is pretty self-explanatory, but basically depending on what you want to um, get out of this, uh, anything that's called a sequence will export as an image sequence. So just image one, two, three, four, five, so on. And then anything else is going to be an actual video, which will also export with audio, which is very important for some uh, things. The rest of it, these are very advanced and they're only for people that know what they're doing. If they have a specific requirement, such as rendering patch tracing or rendering only the reflections or lightning or anything like that, that's more as I said to you, more advanced and only for people who already know what they're doing in Unreal and, and have a requirement for these particular types of rendering. But by default, the uh, uh, this one here, the deferred rendering, is what you're going to be using. Now, another thing you can do is press the setting buttons in here and select console variables, which will allow you to press this plus button and add various different console commands to be applied when you start the export. And I'll show you an example of these. So if I load my render settings, I've got some console variables right here. And I would recommend that you actually look at these console variables and use them yourself. It's still really good to get a better looking image in your final render. And there are other console variables that you can add, but these are the ones that I use for most of my renders as well. And that's kind of the explanation between, between, be, behind the movie render queue. Now, the other option is for you to use the legacy movie scene capture. And if you select that and you press this button, this is the render movie uh, settings for that. And it gives you some options, like, for example, what type of exports to do, much like the uh, movie render queue. This is what I would call a bit more less advanced, more basic, and probably more useful for people who are just starting out. But very importantly here is that um, you can you know, uh, set a custom uh, FPS rate, resolution, um, in terms of the, um, you know, if you want a texture stream or not, which I would recommend keeping that off, what type of compression quality. So normally you want to put this at 100% so there's no compression. And then the folder where this is exporting um, and some other options in here that are very self-explanatory. Honestly, you just hover over them and it tells you. But most of the things in here, you don't really would wouldn't really need to touch, just leave them as default, apart from the compression, resolution, FPS, and where you want to save. Actually, now that I remember, I haven't specifically told you on the movie render queue, how do you export? So over in here, where you have the output, um, you can actually press the output and you can select where the sequence is going and what resolution it's at, what FPS. So pretty much the settings that were in the legacy one are also here but they're all based on various, you know, in different panels. So segmented in such a way that it allows you for more flexibility and to focus on what's important to you. Um, so that's kind of it in that regard. Once you select the sequence and what you want to export, then you can do that. Um, and as I said to you, the, the render uh, will come out with uh, various different sort of, uh, well, whatever, whatever your scene was. I'm just going to be, I'm going to go in here and just show you guys a sort of an example. Um, so 
uh, let me just bring one over here. So this is where I have an example um, of some a sequence. So this one is starting at 0, 0, 0, and it goes all the way to 11,000, right? So that's a very long sequence. So if we uh, double click this and open it, and I start, you know, sliding to the right, you can see that that, that that sort of animation is playing there like that from an image point of view. So now you just need the software to put it together uh, because I didn't export this as a video file. I exported it as an image sequence, which is very helpful, especially if you're going to get a crash or something like that. You're just going to be able to save the project quite easily because you're going to have an image sequence and the crash happens only at a certain point and you can still keep all the frames you've done until that point. Just bear in mind that real-time animation means that some of the things that you've rendered from frame 0 to 100 will not be identical to you rendering again from 0 to 100 if some of the effects that you were using were reliant on things like Niagara particles or things like that. GPU particles generally do not behave in the same way when you play them again. There will be various changes uh, so be, be mindful of that information before you commit to uh, sort of stop a sequence midway and then resume it later on because you might just get a sort of a you know a clear transition from a different from a sequence to another sort of setup sequence that you've done so that's very important uh to note as well um and uh, yeah I would, I would definitely recommend that you do um camera cuts rather than take this one camera and move it to another place on the scene very quickly to, to basically say well you know i've just transitioned to a new uh, viewpoint with the same camera because unreal will actually render that for a split second you will be able to see your camera moving from this position to the next position very quickly it's just faintly visible but it will be and you'll have to edit that out um or as i said you just set up a new camera you can duplicate the camera with all the settings you've done and just resume using that one if you'd like, but uh, that's just my recommendation to you. And we're finally at the end. I hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial. I hope you learned something. Please leave a like, comment, subscribe if you have. I would like to extend my thanks to my Patreons and people that have supported me over the years. Uh, what I would like to say to you guys is that uh, I would make a version of this tutorial that goes in a far more complex uh, sort of, um, you know, footage of it and just go through a lot of the... Uh, stuff that I normally do to set up my cinematics. Please let me know in the comments below if you're interested in something like that. I am I am greatly appreciative of any kind of feedback that you guys may have. Please feel free to let me know what you'd like to learn about next and I will try to make that happen. Uh, so yeah, thank you for watching and I'll see you guys in the next tutorial. Keep creating.